go. Today is Reformation Sunday, but this is not the day, of course, uh, that, that the Reformation, right, started. Uh, what day did the Reformation actually start? Yeah, the 31st, right? So October 31st, what year? Yeah, I already gave that away, right? 501 years ago. So do your math, right? 15, 17, uh, October 31st. Luther went to the, Witten, the church of Wittenberg and nailed up 95 theses, uh, topics he wanted to talk about with the church. He said, hey, there's something going on. Uh, there's some corruption here. There's some things that we're just not getting right. Let's just talk about this. Um, he sought to do what? Reform, right? That was Luther's whole thing, to reform the church, not to start Lutheranism. Uh, he just wanted to reform the church as it existed because he loved the church. Right? God ordained the church to be, so he, he said, let's reform this and get it right. That wasn't going to happen, uh, so from there we have Protestantism, right? and out of that, Lutheranism comes. Um, but his, his initial thought wasn't to just start a new church, it was to reform. Um, and as I said, that, that's not quite what happened. At the heart of the Reformation are the five solas, right? So um, grace alone, faith alone, um, um, grace alone, faith alone, uh, Christ alone, uh, sh- Scripture alone, and to God be the glory of alone. These the heart, uh, these five solas are the, the heart of the Reformation. It's from there everything else springs. Um, but we kind of need to think about this too, that the Reformation isn't just about religious reform. Uh, the Reformation was, really had all sorts of ramifications. Uh, it dealt with uh, political reform. It dealt with financial reform. Um, this was just part of it that got caught up into it. Granted, Granted, the huge, the biggest piece, right? Because it's all about our eternal salvation and life in Christ. Um, but your banking, how we do business, uh, the governments, right? This, this all springs out of uh, the Reformation. So don't just think, hey, that's kind of neat that happened and churches now, you know, exist and how they exist. It has all sorts of things. Um, but one of the things that came out of the Reformation that we don't really talk about theologically is the doctrine of vocation. Right? We, we don't give much, much talk to that. We don't, we don't speak much about vocation. Do you all have a vocation, by the way? Yeah? Five or ten of you have vocations. The rest of you are still wondering what vocation even is. Right? Um, we all have a vocation. In fact, many of us, all of us, really have more than one vocation. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today and, and, and next week, too. The, this doctrine of vocation, why it's so important. Vocation is really a part of God's plan from the get-go. Right? And it's important to us because it's... it's it's what we do. It's really who we are. So let's take a look at this and, and what, it's, what it's really all about. Um, the doctrine of vocation is essentially this, that God works through people um, in whatever vocation he has called them to. Um, give me an idea, th- throw it out. What, what vocation do you have? What are some of them? Teacher, what was that? Okay, so there's something back there too. Yes, what else? So teachers are the only vacation. Good. So yes, if you're a, what? Mother. mother. Yeah, see, we've got we to gotta broaden our idea of vocation. It's not just teachers, but it's mothers. It's not just engineers, but it's fathers. It's not just parents, but it's kids. It's not just um, employees, but it's employers. It's students. Everything, right? I am a, I, my vocation is a son. It's a husband. It's a father and a pastor. This is my vocation. You have different vocations. And this is essential for us to understand this idea that God works through us, through our vocations. And you might be sitting here thinking, really? I paid good money for this, and this is what you're telling me? This is a huge deal. This is really a giant deal for us to to grasp, to to get hold of. Um, It was a huge deal back then because at the time of the Reformation, the only vocation that counted was what? Priests. Anything in the church, right? So if you were a nun, a monk, a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, that was the one that counted. That was the one that God, God ordained. That was the, those were the vocations that were going to make a difference in the, in, in the kingdom of God. Everything else didn't really matter. So if you make candles, great, that's awesome. I can see a little better. But that didn't matter for God's kingdom. The only thing that God really cared about were those people, those vocations that worked in the church. Well, Luther and the Reformers came along and said, whoa. That's not true at all. Every vocation, every vocation, every person, man, woman, and child is important to God. God ordained all of these vocations to to, to, to play a part in his kingdom building. And I bring it up now for us today because I think we've lost touch of how important this is and God's plan for this. And this wasn't something that Luther just thought of. It's not like Luther was in in the castle going, let's see, how can I really stick it to the Catholic Church? 
That's not what he said. He said, you know what? This is one of the things that they have gotten wrong. And so how are we going to reform this? He goes, this goes back to the beginning. This is part of what God ordained from the very beginning. Just like all of the reformations, right? Reformations, right? All the reformations. They're not something that Luther made up or the other reformers. These are found in Scripture. And this idea of vocation comes from Scripture as well. So go back to Genesis 1 that we just read. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God said, let us make man, right, in his image. Let us make man in our, in our image and let him carry out, paraphrase here, let us carry out his work. Let, 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 let him carry out his, our work. Did I say that right? Let man, right, male and female, let them carry out our work in this world. This is the doctrine of vocation, that God creates us in his image to carry out his work in this world. This is what Genesis 1 tells us. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's the only time that God mentions it then, is in Genesis 1. Well, that's not true. You've got to read the whole scripture to get the full doctrine of it. He mentions it, first of all, in Genesis 1. But in Ecclesiastes 3, it says this. There is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work. Right? That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. Then in Colossians 3, it says this. And whatever you do, right, whatever your vocation, we could say that, whatever your vocation, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Right? It's, in other words, what you do as a mother, as a child, as a father, as a husband, as an engineer, as a lawyer, as a street sweeper, as a cook, as, as a uh, consumer, as a boss, as an employee, what you do, do it to God's glory because that is where God has placed you and put you to work for his kingdom, to fulfill his purpose. Now, of course, being Reformation Sunday, I've talked an awful lot about works, and you know that kind of goes against the grain. Because the Reformation is all about, we are saved how? Saved by grace, right? We are saved by God's work towards us, not our works towards him. In fact, our works count for nothing in that relationship, amen? Nothing at all. There's nothing you can do to affect God's love for you. There's nothing you can do work-wise that, that God says, oh, okay, here's my salvation for you. That's not how this works. We are totally lost, helpless, and hopeless. We are dead in our sins, the Bible says. We are enemies of God. We have no hope on our own. There's nothing we can do. So by God's initiative, God's own grace and work, God comes to us through Jesus Christ and brings salvation for us. Amen? It is only God's work that does this. But our works play a part somewhere, don't they? Don't our works factor in here? Some form or fashion? Here's what Luther says. He says, God does not need our works. Would you agree with that? Good. God does not need our works, but your neighbor does. Right? That's what Luther says. He says, God doesn't need your works. He doesn't need anybody's works, but your neighbor does. Your neighbor needs your works. This is where our works come into play. God has saved us. Amen. Praise God for that. Or we're lost forever. God has saved us. Now what do we do? Now we work. We work not for our salvation, but because we're saved. To bring his light and his love to our neighbors. So what's the big deal then? Let's just do that. Well, we struggle with it, don't we? We struggle with it. My guess is, as most uh, America is, when that alarm goes off in the morning, I doubt any of you go, Woo! Another day! Let's get at it! Right? My guess is most of you do this. Right? Or you say, I can't believe it's another day. Here we go again. Right? Or you think, oh, I don't like my boss. Or my teacher hates me. I don't want to go. Or you're thinking, oh, my students again. Or you're thinking, I got a client who's just a pain. Or you're thinking, man, I got to wake up and my mom and dad, they're on my case. Or you wake up and you roll out of bed and you go, oh, my kids are just always nagging at me. Right? That's how most of us treat it. It's like another day of work. Another day we have to go through this. You know, that I, you know where that comes from? That work is a burden, not a blessing? Genesis 3. Genesis 3 is where this comes from. Because in Genesis 1, we have God working, right? We have God working. We have God creating. God is a God of work. God is a God of creativity. God is a God of imagination. God is a God who does and interacts and performs. And he calls us to do the same. And he says, your vocation is a blessing. So be involved and do what I do. You are, my, you are created in my image. Let's get about doing this. That's Genesis 1. And then Genesis 3 comes along. And what happens? 
the fall, right? Sin enters the world. And now, because sin enters the world, our vocation, this idea of work, it becomes corrupt. It's part of the curse, right? What God ordained is good. Sin has, has, has taken it and manipulated it and turned it bad. And we see work now as a burden. Or we see work only as a way to get my paycheck to get what I want. We see work not for the joy it brings. Our vocations don't bring us joy. They don't, they don't help fulfill God's purpose. Our vocations are something that we have to bear and get through. And nothing could be further from the truth. But we have taken that idea and we've manip- manipulated it and we've distorted it. And so now we have parents who are ab- abort and abuse their children as opposed to caring for and loving their children. Right? We have children who don't seek to honor and bless their parents, as Scripture says they should do, but we have children who dishonor and disrespect and disobey their parents. We have, we have, uh, we have companies and we have businessmen and women who seek not to serve consumers, but to pad their own pockets. Right? We have taken this idea of vocation and turned it into a selfish, self-centered idea. We've taken what God has ordained as good and made it into a selfish burden. So what do we do about this? How do we release ourselves of this burden? How do we get rid of it? How do we turn it back into the blessing that God intended? Well, quite simply, we remember what the Reformation is all about. We remember what the truth of Scripture is. And the truth of Scripture, the truth of the Reformation is this, that Jesus Christ came for sinners, right? Raise your hand if you're a sinner. Good. I got two, right? Jesus came for sinners, which means he came for us. He came to redeem us. He came to make us right. He came to, he came to save us and make us gods, God's own, God's children, not by our works, but by God's grace. And remembering that he came not just for us, and to restore us, but he came to restore all things, including our idea of work and vocation, including what we do and how we live here. Christ's redemption is for all aspects of this world and everything we do. When we remember that we are part of God's plan and purpose created in his image, it gives meaning now to our vocation. Whether you you are retired or you are a first grader, whether you work downtown in a building or if you work in, 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 um, in, in, the, in the garbage plant, whether you work at the recycling place or you re- work at Charina Puppy Chow that you smell going down I-70, right? Wherever you work, whatever you do, whether it's in home, a house mom or dad, whether you're a child there or a parent there, your vocation is meant to bring honor and glory to God and his kingdom. You have a purpose, a God given purpose to make a difference in this world for his kingdom. Luther said this about our vocations. He said our vocations are masks, masks of God. And it's through these masks that God, that that people see God in us. Your vocation is how people see God. That should give you great joy. That should give you great purpose. That should cause you to not wake up in the morning and go, oh my goodness. But to wake up in the morning and say, oh thank God. I get to live another day for your glory and your kingdom. I get to carry out your purpose for me. This is what it's about. You are the mask of God in this world. And I want to leave you with this thought here. If, if we are the masks of God, right? If, our, if in our vocations we reveal God to others because he dwells in us and through our masks, then let me ask you this. If it's in me, it's in who else? You. So God doesn't need our works but our neighbor does. Yet as I minister to my neighbor, who else am I ministering to? Who else am I ministering to? If God dwells in me, and he dwells in you, and I minister to you, who am I ministering to? To God, aren't I? Aren't I ministering to God in that? Doesn't Jesus say that in Matthew 25? Doesn't he say, hey, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was in prison and you came to visit. And they said, Jesus, we never saw you. All we saw was our neighbor over there. He goes, yeah. All I saw was the the kids at Foothills who were hungry. Yeah. All I saw were those kids who who needed the shoebox for Operation Christmas Child. He says, yeah, that's me. That's where I dwell. Just as I dwell in you, I dwell in them. 
That's our vocation coming out, serving not just people, but serving Jesus Christ. Does God need our good works? Wow, people. Does God need your good works? No, but your neighbor does. Your neighbor does. God has given us the blessing of, of, of work, the blessing of vocation in this world. Let's go make a difference in the lives of others to God's glory. Amen.